you know, the, the research is, is, I think, very clear, very compelling, uh, that uh, these, the use of these public sector wage bill constraints undermines human rights, blocks the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals, absolutely blocks progress on women's rights, and actually uh, has left countries ill-prepared for COVID, let alone the coming uh, the, the climate crisis. Um, and despite the fact that in some places in the IMF headquarters, there's been a bit of a shift of rhetoric, in practice at country level, there's almost no change whatsoever. Uh, uh, these uh, policies are uh, very much the same as have been imposed uh, uh, for, 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 for a generation. Um, our calculations suggest that just in these 15 countries we studied in great detail, uh, the effect of these constraints has been to, to stop the recruitment of 3 million frontline public sector workers in recent years. Um, uh, and so the impact is really quite devastating. The IMF themselves are always claiming that these are temporary measures, but in fact we found that these measures were anything but temporary, that they have been continuing in every country we studied for at least three years and in most countries for uh, five or six years. Um, and when you look at the logic and the rationale and the justifications that they provide, there's pretty much no leg to stand on for the use of these wage bill constraints. They persuade countries to cut the percentage of uh, GDP spent on the public sector wage bill, whether it's at 17% as it is in Zimbabwe or 10% as it is in Liberia, or even when it's 1.8% as it is in Nigeria, even when you're spending way below the global average, uh, countries are being consistently advised to cut further. Um, and uh, every single country that we studied was being driven below the global average of spending. On, uh, uh, on the wage bill as a percentage of GDP, which ends up creating this sort of downward spiral. So countries are ending up sort of uh, chasing to the bottom on how little they can spend on frontline public sector workers. Um, and you know, at any point when these uh, constraints are recommended, when recommendations to cut or freeze are made, there are always alternatives. There's always alternatives about taking bold action, for example, to increase the, uh, domestic, uh, the, the uh, tax to GDP in a progressive way. Unfortunately, we found very little evidence that there was um, compelling action to exp expand domestic tax revenues, which is one of the most uh, clear and obvious alternatives to imposing austerity. One of the other arguments which we looked at, well, one of the other things which we uncovered in this report, I think, is just how much the IMF is using quite dodgy data, um, uh, uh, making all sorts of weird comparisons between countries which really should not be compared with each other. Vietnam being told it needs to cut because it's spending much more than low income countries. Well, it's not a low income country, so why would that comparison be made? Um, we found consistently arguments that, oh, well, the public sector wage bill needs to be cut because there's a public sector premium that people are being paid more than the private sector. And yet the reverse argument is never used. It's only ever used to drive things downwards. Um, we found that there was never any authoritative use of the uh, very shocking data about the number of shortages that are of frontline health workers or education workers. World Health Organization collects data uh, on nurses and doctors. Uh, UNESCO collects data on teachers. None of that data was ever looked at, uh, even where there were really quite disturbing levels of cuts being uh, made uh, to, uh, uh, to different sectors. And although the IMF claimed um, that they routinely protected health and education workers, we found that they did not do that in two thirds of countries. And in, even in the one third of countries where they claim to have protected health and education workers, uh, in fact, uh, the impact was usually associated with a, a freeze of spending, which over time uh, would end up uh, being equivalent to a cut. But there was a very disturbing, I think, uh, you know, one of the things which becomes clear, the more you look at IMF documentation and justifications and narratives on this is, the extreme level of infrastructure fundamentalism, an absolute belief that somehow, even in times of recession, you should defend infrastructure spending, um, but not treating frontline public sector workers as a co core part of the infrastructure of the country, which in many ca cases would make common sense. 
So actually what happens is that this is part of an agenda of privatization and of shifting resources, public money into the private sector through public-private partnerships. Because of course, with infrastructure spending, it's very easy to uh, uh, outsource and to, 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 to tender out to private companies. Uh, but when you're dealing with the wage bill, uh, that's a much more difficult thing to tender out. So why is there a logic, a preference for infrastructure from the World Bank and the IMF? It seems to be caught up with a sort of prejudice against the public sector. And that's something which we sort of uh, drive into more and more that the, in the absence of a evidence, in the, uh, in the absence of a, a clear logic to constantly constraining and cutting the public sector wage bill, what we're really dealing with is ideology, it's a deep unconscious bias, it's a disbelief in the public sector and an attachment, a sort of uh, overwhelming belief that somehow the private sector is going to uh, uh, save things. Well, I think what we have found, and particularly at this political, uh, this moment in time with COVID, where there's been, I think, you know, countries which have actually had stronger public systems have dealt more successfully. In the light of the, cl of the climate crisis, there needs to be a radical reimagining of the public sector, a, re, a refocusing on the potential of the public sector be, to be uh, uh, an engine of growth, an engine of sustainable development, um, and to rethink the, the prejudices that have uh, undermined the public sector uh, for a generation. We, uh, in parts of the report, talk about the cult of austerity, that there's a shrinking number of people who are actually adherents to this, uh, belief system, but unfortunately those people are concentrated in the IMF at country level and in ministries of finance. And the revolving doors between ministries of finance and the IMF become uh, a big part of the problem. And the other pivotal problem is, is the culture of secrecy and lack of transparency. The deals are struck behind closed doors between the IMF and, the, uh, and ministries of finance, so they can each blame each other uh, uh, for, for problems uh, and, and that has got to be blown open. If we don't use this as the moment to, to, to end that sort of secrecy and that cult uh, that is, is blocking progress on, uh, on development, even, as I say, in the IMF's own terms, in the assessment of their own research depart department, uh, neoliberalism has been oversold and needs to be radically rethought. And this is almost certainly the moment to do so, but we need to work together we need international NGOs to come together with uh, trade unions uh, and at national level, we need to build much stronger alliances with a whole range of different actors, those defending public services, those working for tax and fiscal justice, those working with youth movements or feminist movements. We need to find the common ground to push back against austerity and remake the case of investment in the public sector and particularly in the frontline public sector workforce. So that's the focus of today. The report is available uh, on ActionAid's website and PSI's website, I think also on EI's website. Uh, there's an executive summary, which is available in French and Spanish and Portuguese and Arabic and Nepalese, and I think will be available in other languages soon. Um, this part of our global launch, this is an eight and a half hour global launch, this part uh, we've called the international segment, and I'm delighted that we've been joined uh, by Rosa Pavanelli, the uh, General Secretary of Public Services International. And I'd like to pass over to her, first of all, to say a few words uh, about how you see uh, this work. Thank you very much, David. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for this report that is uh, uh, really helping in making clear how ideological is the approach of the financially global financial institution, IMF, and I would say World Bank is not second, uh, and how critical is the fact that we need uh, to put under discussion the Washington Consensus. That's the clear point. Uh, the figures that are uh, reported are very important. Three million workers in public sector, in frontline services lost uh, during uh, the period leading up to the pandemic and during the pandemic itself is something outrageous, something outrageous. 78% uh, of the 
uh, lowest income countries that uh, have been forced uh, uh, to cut or freeze wages uh, and public employment uh, um, is uh, really something that is uh, not simply not understandable that makes no sense at all if we consider that public services are crucial to sustain uh, not only people the well-being of people but also the local communities the local economy and the idea itself of development unless we consider that development is just an economic factor and nothing more than that uh, I think it is important how you are highlighting uh, uh, the fact uh, that uh, public services are essential to deliver sustainable development goal, but above all, I think to deliver the fundamental human rights that can help to fight against poverty and uh, ensure dignity to everyone around across the, the, uh, the globe. And it's important to uh, underline the fact that, as you say in the report, uh, the conditionalities that are uh, imposed for uh, loans to governments are often without criteria, are simply an ideological tool to impose the continuation of a neo-colonial system, the continuation of a neo-capitalism, uh, neoliberal system. And I would say also uh, the objective to curb the power of workers of the labor movement uh, and uh, trade unions is not by chance that cuts to the uh, wage bill, public uh, wage bill, is often accompanied by the advice to reform the labor market legislation that aim to reduce rights, not only in public sector, but also in the private sector. And that goes hand in hand normally uh, when we look at the impact of uh, of the uh, IMF uh, conditionalities. Uh, it's not by chance and it's just an ideological tool, the attack on public services, the cut uh, and the freezing of uh, employment in public services to show that public service cannot deliver and the private is much better, can deliver better and open the market of public services to private capital. And as you said, it's never assessed the impact of these cuts on the you know, daily life of millions of people. As well, it's never assessed how it impacts on public budget, the privatization of public services. Nobody knows how much dangerous is public-private partnership, how long-term indebtment it's imposing on public budget. And these give the idea of the cultural, you know, neoliberal environment we are in. Do we have tools to do that? I think that we have now a more, more awareness in the public opinion about the importance of public services. That is not only health workers, teachers, uh, education workers, it's also uh, waste collectors, uh, energy, water delivery, uh, sanitation. It was clear during the pandemic that these are essential workers, transport workers. But I also say, you know, public administration, how could many government deliver, implement emergency policies without the support of public administration employees? We need to be aware and make it clear that this is not happening by chance or by magic. This is the way 
it should work a fair society. And delivering the, me delivering the message that public services are crucial to rebuild in the post pandemic, uh, rebuild better, building back better cannot be back to business as usual, means investing in public services. And I have nothing to add to what you said uh, about uh, this, uh, let me say so, material infrastructure uh, concept. Uh, you know, mm, public services is a fundamental infrastructure for public administration. We never consider that, for instance, a fair judicial efficient system, efficient judicial system counts about 7% of the GDP. We never consider, for instance, the fact that in the least developed countries, lower income countries, public services can count for 64% of the, um, of the, of uh, the, um, material income for uh, people according to the OECD, not according to PSI. Uh, it's, you know, 64% of the disposable income is something that can make the difference between extreme poverty and raising people out of poverty. And this is why we need to continue to work in that direction. We need to continue to advocate together uh, showing that workers' interests and people interests are the same, and our alliance has to be stronger and stronger. And stop all, you know, the attempt to co-opt also social movement, trade unions within this system. That is unfortunately uh, one of the risks that we have in this rebuilding phase uh, uh, after the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Rosa. And um, uh, I would like to pass next to Caroline Otium from the Global Alliance for Tax Justice, because I gather, Caroline, you have to leave us uh, relatively soon. So we'll go to Caroline next, um, hoping that you're ready to step in, Caroline, and then we'll move on to how this uh, from Education International. Um, so Caroline, are you here with us? Hi, hello, David. Hello, everyone. Yes, I'm here. Uh, and uh, thank you for having me uh, during today's launch. I'm excited to be part of this um, session to launch this very uh, groundbreaking report on uh, public versus austerity. And uh, clearly, uh, I'll start by saying that even as we are seeing the pandemic exposing systematic inequalities, both uh, in the social, in the political and in the economic systems, this did not happen out of the blues. It is because of decades of privatization, decades of austerity measures and policies, which of course has resulted in underfunding of key and critical uh, social sectors. And uh, the differentiated impacts that we are seeing, particularly in the global south, they are as a result of uh, neoliberal, neocolonial and patriarchal systems of oppression, particularly through the decades of the structural adjustment programs of the 1980s and uh, 1990s, which of course were promoted by uh, the World Bank uh, and uh, the International uh, Monetary Fund, the IMF. And their main political mantra was really to minimize the welfare state by reducing the involvement of the state in socioeconomic programs. And these policies clearly focused on very unviable capital intensive industries and often in the commodity sectors instead of promoting competitive labor intensive uh, industries. And so we see this background contributing hugely 
to the low average annual growth in most global South countries. I'll give an example of uh, Africa. We see that in the period 2014 to 2019, the annual growth was only 3.3%. And this has therefore meant that public finances are constrained. I'll also say that this has led to the underfunding of uh, social sectors, particularly in health and education systems, and of course has also led to uh, a rapid increase in, in the public debt. We are also seeing large infrastructure deficits as well as um, huge cuts in the public sector uh, wage bill. And which is the central feature of this action aid report. The report clearly points out that cuts in the public sector wage bill acutely impacts on public service provision, particularly for the social sectors. And this could not be further from the truth, you know. And because we see women and girls being acutely impacted when there are cuts, there are budget cuts and their uh, bud uh, budgetary cuts towards uh, salaries of, uh, let's say, uh, nurses, of teachers uh, within uh, the social uh, sectors. So women and girls continue to be negatively impacted when this happens. Uh, we are also seeing African countries having quite an unsustainable uh, levels uh, of debt. Currently, the continent of Africa has an external and domestic debt stock of around 500 billion US dollars. And the median debt to digit GDP ratio has risen from 38% in 2008 to 54% in 2018, in 2018. So clearly, there is a problem and that is not the only issue. We are also seeing the issue of this neoliberal system continuing to entrench a broken international financial system that continues to uh, enable illicit financial flows uh, and tax abuse, tax avoidance, tax evasion by the rich and uh, multinational corporations. Recently, we, we saw uh, the Pandora Papers uh, put out there, really talking about millions uh, of, of dollars stashed away in secrecy jurisdictions, away from the reach of so many uh, governments who would be able to use that resource to be able to publicly fund their uh, uh, budgets. So it's really uh, a shame that the broken tax system allows transnational corporations to minimize their taxations, their, their tax burdens by shifting their profits to offshore tax havens. And we are also seeing these multinational corporations lobbying and obtaining low or zero corporate income tax rates from governments. And uh, this private sector led kind of growth policies has really resulted in severely undermining the capacity of the state to generate domestic resources required to invest in uh, social sectors and also made global South countries particularly to continue to rely on external aid to support uh, government uh, programs. At the Global Alliance for Tax Justice, we underscore the fact that tax is the most sustainable source of government revenue to fund public services. And now, even within this uh, context uh, of the pandemic, uh, we are also seeing quite a number of things beyond the socioeconomic uh, impacts that I've mentioned. We are seeing the centrality of care work also uh, coming to the fore. And so in ensuring the sustainability of the economic and social system, really governments need to provide uh, the resources to do so. But governments are also constrained by international financial institutions like the World Bank, the IMF, putting conditionalities uh, in terms of them 
uh, to be able to receive uh, loans from these institutions. Right. And so governments Caroline. are continually uh, being unable to provide uh, these very critical uh, services. We are witnessing a climate change and the underlying principles of neoliberal economic uh, theory really are what need to be addressed at this point. We need to demand for structural and systemic reforms for redistributive justice, including through progressive taxation, where everybody pays their fair share of tax. It is also important, as David also mentioned at the beginning, to re-examine fiscal and economic priorities by creating alternatives to the current structures of economic models to make it much more fit for purpose and to reinvigorate the role of the state. So right now really is the time also to ensure that feminist perspectives are also at the front and center of this reimagining of the tax system of the economic system, because most often we see women's voices going unheard in policy debates dominated by global capital. So now really is the time for us to join together and to push back against the cult of austerity. Thank you, David. I'll hand Thank you so back. much, Caroline. Uh, absolutely wonderful, um, uh, beautiful arguments, um, much appreciated. So Caroline from the Global Alliance for Tax Justice, thank you very much. We're going to pass over now to Education International to how this was to the Deputy uh, uh, General Secretary. Um, and of course, uh, together with PSI and ActionAid, we've worked together on this report. Over to you, Alice. Well, thank you very much, David. And thank you very much to Rosa for your comments. Thank you very much to Caroline. I think I can agree with everything you said. Try to not repeat too much. But repeating is a good pedagogical principle because you highlight and you remember. You know, when I was looking at this report, it didn't, unfortunately, it surprised me, but some things popped out. And the first thing that popped out at me was that it reveals a lack of transparency. And when you have a lack of transparency, whether it's communicating the conditionalities or it's communicating to your public, you undermine the trust in public budgeting. When you undermine trust in public budgeting, you are indirectly also undermining trust in the public services, in the public sector. And that at the end can also be that you're undermining this trust in the workers who work in the sector. So it has far reaching consequences beyond the financial. It also, for me, reveals a lack of understanding. And if I may use a very simple illustration, that you don't empty a bucket of water when you want to put out a fire. There's so much focus on cut, 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 not how to refill. Now, Caroline was in on the issue of taxes, public money. There are taxes. But you are never going to get a reliable system of taxation, whether it's direct or indirect, if it's not based on trust. If people do not trust where their money is going, if there's not transparency around it, they're going to resist paying it, whether those are companies or individuals. So we go back to the trust. But there's also a lack of will, a lack of will to build up basic infrastructure, which for me, public services are, which makes a society tick and makes a society develop. Also, the private sector within the society. We need the common glue that is the public sector. And it's also a lack of respect for the commitments, as you said, David, which are made through the Sustainable Development Goals, because they are commitments that are universal. They are supposed to reach everyone. And we know that the only way you can reach everyone is when governments through their public sector take responsibility. And I would like to especially underline that teachers are crucial for, for ensuring inclusive, equitable, quality education for all. They're not an unnecessary expense. They are a necessary investment. And you will only reach education for all if you do it through public education. We are now seeing that some think that you can develop education through technology, and then they talk about investments. But when they talk about teachers, they talk about wage bill constraints or expenses. But we know from research that it's real life people, it's quality teachers 
that make our the greatest quality in-house effect on education. So we need to be seen as an investment, not as an expense, and it has to go over the public wage bill. Recently, during the pandemic, we've seen through the school closures that the public have begun to understand this, that it is important that you have qualified teachers, that you have real life teachers, and that you have a good building for them to meet the children in. It's, the, it's emerging there and we need to play off it because memory is short, we're going to lose it. Because despite the public celebration of teachers and of course of health workers, and many other essential workers, it, this research shows that we're still considered as just an unwanted cost rather than the value. And if I may say, alongside so many other workers that are doing traditionally care work that very often is seen as the work of women that they historically did without being paid. We have seen in this report that the wage bill constraints lead to two things, blocks in recruitment and pay restrictions for teachers. That means we will not recruit new and we will not be able to retain the ones we had. It's lowering the freezing teacher salaries so they do not earn and other workers too a decent wage. They will leave or they will take additional jobs and the quality of their work will go down. They will not only impact the teacher profession, those uh, constraints, they will have a devastating effect on the whole education sector. When the teacher wage bill is cut, students' right to quality education is threatened by a lack of qualified teachers and unacceptably large class sizes. Tomorrow, EI is launching its findings from a global survey of our member organizations on the status of teachers. It shows, it proves what the, this report on the wage bill constraints indicates. Teacher attrition is high, is threatened by poor working and employment conditions, and 48% of the respondents say that the teaching profession is not attractive to young people. 59% of respondents said that casual and short-term contracts has increased in their countries. At the same time, teachers are reporting word intensification and quantity. And the research in Nepal, Malawi, Zambia, Senegal, they've shown the difficult conditions that teachers are working in. The narratives are true. They're the real life stories from the ground. Poor pay, lack of benefits, threatening their right to decent work, being paid privately from school resources or directly from parents. They're not being paid during school closures, work overload, class size sometimes over 100. We need to do something about this and we need to do something together. At EI, we stand together with you in ActionAid, with PSI and with other allies that we have to address this, we have to break the narrative and show there is another uh, narrative, there is another solution, and it can actually work. Just look at all the countries that have used stimulus packages during this pandemic to keep themselves going. Sometimes the same countries that depend that others do the cuts. So let's keep on fighting and do it together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hal, this um, perfect. And um, actually, you give me a, a, a perfect uh, reason for seeking now into hearing some frontline voices from Nepal and some, some of the experiences of teachers. We've got three short videos that we'll now see. Before we go to the videos, just to flag, if anybody does have any questions, uh, you can put them in the Q&A. We have one question already, already from Professor Keith Lewin. And so uh, any of uh, our panelists who wishes to uh, think about an answer for that um, uh, can uh, uh, prepare something, um, then we'll come back to you later. Um, but any additional questions will be welcomed. I'm going to pass over now um, to, uh, to our tech support who will show the three short videos from Nepal. or at least I was hoping we would be able to pass over to our tech support to show those videos.
if that's problematic at this moment for some reason, uh, okay, I think they've just come back in. Uh, we'll show the short videos from Nepal and then we'll go to hear from Isabel Ortiz after that. So let's hear those videos, please. I'm a headmaster of Vishaniketan School in Kathmandu, Nepal. More than 60% of teachers in our school are paid salaries from school resources. It is a huge burden in school. When a teacher paid by the government retires, it takes years to get a replacement from the government. I jokingly call this getting the WTO membership. Students can't wait. We are forced to hire private teachers. I am a mathematics teacher in Vishwa Niketan School since the past 28 years. I was previously a government appointed teacher, but later I shifted to being a private teacher. My salaries are paid from the school resources and I do not get any allowances. I do not get pension after retirement. And I am really anxious what will happen to me after I retire. Also, I have never been promoted since my appointment. I'm an English teacher in Saramjit Kisor Secondary School for the last 22 years. I've been teaching for the last 37 years. The waste cut is not a recent phenomenon. I used to get allowances for being a class teacher, for invigilating exams and for checking students' exam papers, ETC. Over the past 10 years, I have lost all those allowances. Our earnings is gradually eroded. Many of us do not realize that. Uh, many thanks to uh, Education International uh, for uh, those videos. And uh, in a bit, we'll see some videos also from uh, uh, produced by Public Services International. But before we go to that, um, I'd like to hand over to uh, Isabel Ortiz, who is the uh, uh, director of the Global Social Justice Program at the Initiative for Policy Dialogue. Um, uh, over to you, Isabel, for some reflections. I mean, your own work has been so important for informing our work. Be delighted that you're able to join us today. Thank you very much, David. And it is me who actually has to congratulate you for this launch and for the report. The report is enormously important and it should really be read by governments, international organizations, parliament, parliaments, um, UN organizations, international organizations, civil society, and be used for national dialogue to avoid these negative uh, austerity cuts that we, we are talking about. And why is that? And I would like to show the magnitude of the problem, if you allow me. Let me share a screen. Can you see the map? So the reason for that, it is uh, because uh, shown in this map. This map shows the number of countries that are going to be having um, austerity cuts in at the end of this year. This means just now as we are speaking and in 2022. And this is in, in red color. And um, as you can see, more than 6 billion people or 85% of the world population are going to be having austerity cuts uh, just now. Um, so this, this made us launch this global austerity alert because um, 159 countries are expected to implement austerity cuts. Now, what is very important is that this does not need to happen. These are, this is what IMF um, economists predict that is going to happen. And it is in our hands to make a different story by avoiding it, by calling for national dialogues instead of these you know, um, decisions taken behind closed doors. And um, because most importantly, the key issue is, let's see here, this is that these austerity cuts are not needed at all. There are alternatives, even in the poorest countries. And we don't have time to explain here anymore, but this is work that has been published repeatedly by the 
United Nations, by the Interna International Labour Organization, by UNICEF and UN Women. It is translated in several languages and you can do download. So the key thing is that there are at least eight eight financing options, and they are all supported by statements of the international financial organizations and the United Nations and governments around the world have been applying them for years. Um, so there are alternatives that they are feasible and can be done to avoid these austerity cuts. And these eight options are increasing progressive tax revenues. Um, these, there are many types of taxes um, from more progressive to less progressive will be income and wealth taxation, including corporate taxes. Uh, also to the financial sector that by the way, is not tax in an or tax or paying very little tax in a majority of countries. And then you have import, ex, import export taxes, uh, sin taxes, um, uh, consumption taxes, which are the most regressive and are to be avoided. Um, and there are phenomenal examples from around the world. Let me give you a few. Uh, Mongolia, for instance, paid a universal child benefit, means for all children, uh, financed by a, a small tax on copper exports. Um, Brazil, for instance, paid the expansion of social protection during 15 years through a very, very small financial transaction tax that worked very well and it was very easy to implement. Um, in Africa, a number of countries have been um, uh, putting taxes on mineral extraction. So, you know, th these are all very feasible options that the world the countries and governments need to explore before entering in any austerity cut. Second is fighting illicit financial flows, and these are illegal, they must be avoided, and we are talking about tax evasion, money laundering, or trade mispricing, and they're very good studies done by, by many organizations on this. Third, and this is very important option, it is reducing debt. And uh, of course, because of the pandemic spending, uh, many countries are heavily indebted at the moment or with high debts. Now we have very good experiences from the past. Uh, in recent decades, more than 60 countries um, um, have actually restructured and reduced significantly their debts. Um, so, so that can be done. Fourth option is to reallocate public expenditures, cutting, um, um, replacing high cost and low social impact spending, like for instance, defense or military, and putting it to public services. And we have very good examples, uh, like Costa Rica and Thailand, both of them cut defense spending and invested into health services. For social protection, a fifth option, financing option, is to increase social security coverage, uh, formalizing workers in the informal sector with good contracts. And we have very good examples coming from uh, Uruguay, Brazil, Argentina, and others. Uh, for low-income countries, we have a sixth option, a financing option, which it will be lobby for more aid. Um, a seventh option will be to tap into fiscal and foreign exchange reserves. And this sounds kind of, of a difficult thing to understand, but um, it say it in two seconds. Uh, most countries, uh, for a very conservative orthodox policy, have been accumulating reserves in the central bank. In sub-Saharan Africa, this means that countries that were actually had uh, uh, in very difficult situations of food security with populations were starving, the reality is that they, they were they had all these huge amounts of foreign exchange reserves just there in sitting in the central bank. That that decision cannot just be a technocratic decision alone. That needs to be put to the public to see where are you going to opt to keep it there above the accepted standard of four four months of exports or to use it for people. And the eighth financing option is to adopt a more accommodative macroeconomic framework that means some tolerance to inflation and fiscal deficit. And this is particularly important now because we're going to have a situation with a, a little bit higher inflation in many countries. Now, all these options, uh, one to eight, a number of them exist in all countries. So it means that governments need to be more aggressive in, in, in pursuing these different avenues and uh, instead of going for our steady cuts. What countries normally do is actually pick a bit of 
this option, this option, this option, these options. And then instead of having a very, very tiny budget, they actually have a larger pie that they can be used for public services and then necessarily in human investment. That's why all these decisions cannot be taken behind closed doors by some technocrats at the ministries of finance with the help of the IMF or not. And they must be discussed openly in national dialogue with trade unions, employers, uh, government, civil society organizations, and any relevant stakeholder. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Isabel. And uh, coming from the country um, of Margaret Thatcher, who famously said there is no alternative, uh, it's wonderful to hear that there are plenty of alternatives. There are so many alternatives to austerity, to cuts in the public sector. And I think you make a very compelling case that this is the moment when people should explore all of those alternatives. So thank you very much. I want to um, pass now back to, uh, to hear um, two short videos from Ghana and Nigeria uh, made by Public Services International, uh, specifically for the launch of this report. Um, if I can pass over to the tech support um, and hope that you can share those videos. Thank you. Investments in health have been have been very low, and it's about time we invest more in health. When you look at the numbers, thousands of nurses are, are trained every year. They cannot be employed because there's an IMF directive. IMF should at this time not be given conditionalities for support that it gives to nations, such that embargoes are placed on employment and all that. It does not augur well for all of us. We still have areas that are underserved with, with not just nurses, but other health workers. Providing more nurses to these areas would be able to keep the issues of sometimes um, um, delay, delay in emergency care or delay in primary health care. Obviously, um, employing more health workers, whether they are doctors, they are nurses, they are pharmacists, lab people or whatever, ensures that whatever services these professionals provide will be readily available for Ghanaians as and when they need them. Government refused employing, telling us there is no money. There is an em there is embargo on employment. So the ones that are on ground, they are overstressing themselves. You imagine last week we were two on duty. I have a delivery. The pressure we put on the, on the bed was cleaning that the drip has finished. No, nobody to come and remove it. But by the standard of WHO, a nurse is supposed to handle four patients. But here, if you go in now, you see the crowd inside. They are up to 150, and we're only two nurses on duty. Some of our uh, co-workers died also. We were not provided with PPE because one, we were not having the money to buy those things, and the government did not provide. I appeal to IMF instead of giving those stringent con uh, conditions, they should allow the country to operate the way the citizen will feel the, imp the positive impact of the loan they are giving. It doesn't make sense. Thank you so much for those. And uh, immediately after this international segment of the uh, launch, we will be uh, going uh, to West Africa. And in fact, we'll uh, hear directly from uh, Perpetual, who was uh, one of the uh, people speaking uh, in the Ghana video there. We'll hear more uh, voice. 
the front line. Um, so um, we are now, um, th there's a couple of questions which have come up in the Q and A. Um, if you do have any questions, please do flag uh, uh, those for us. Um, and uh, we will have our last input from uh, Bumika now, um, who uh, joins us um, from uh, the Thurbo Network and um, has been a great champion of uh, feminist alternatives to uh, the dominant macroeconomic policies. I'm going to pass over to you, Bumika. Thank you so much, David and Roos. And it is my absolute honor to be part of this fantastic launch. Um, can't think of anything more urgent and imperative right now than a real serious debate on public versus austerity to reveal so clearly today the neoliberal economic ideology that effectively deploys the state to serve the market through international institutions and the constraining of policy norms. We see clearly in the IMF's uh, policy measures how 20th century neoliberalism today not only involves the well-known policy pillars of liberalization, privatization, deregulation, but also as we see in this in these loan measures, we see in these um, erosion of the welfare state and public services, the creation of an entire international financial architecture that does not liberate the market as the rhetoric often goes, but rather protects the market at the expense of the public domain. That is public systems, sectors, and services. We see for several decades the IMF's contentious legacy of structural adjustment that has generated explicitly unequal and gendered impacts, eroding the welfare state across the global south and constraining the policy space of developing country governments to specifically place the economic and social rights of their people above the need to repay wealthy international creditors and lenders. Indeed, the UN reports that 41 developing countries actually reduced their total budget expenditures as the pandemic unfurled in 2020. We also know a devastating debt pandemic of historic proportions is sweeping across developing countries who have collectively paid over 194 billion to private multilateral and bilateral creditors in 2020. For perspective, this amounts to four times the total resources of all IMF emergency financing since the beginning of the pandemic. In 2020, external public debt service was larger than healthcare expenditure in at least 62 countries, larger than education expenditure in at least 36 countries, with 58 countries experiencing more revenues, leaving their borders than coming in, thus confirming the fiscal drain and the net resource transfer from the global south to the global north. So specifically in the absence of scaled up coordinated and multilateral solutions, such as a sovereign debt workout mechanism, such as fiscal space measures, the noxious austerity mandate of the 1980s lost decade structural adjustment era is once again being repeated in order to generate the financial resources to meet debt payments and stabilize debt levels. So it is in this context of a deeply constrained fiscal space that a pandemic of gender inequalities is also unfolding. Women become involuntary shock absorbers and auxiliary public service providers in that they are de facto providing the public services that their state fails to due to having to prioritize creditors and appease IMF measures. And this is resulting in sharp increases in unpaid care work and low wage informal sector work. And in this process, their labor, and in fact, their physical health, mental health, becomes the embodied channels through which their nation's debts are repaid, while their risk of falling into poverty is heightened through public budget cuts on public services, especially health and education, regressive and indirect taxation measures, such as the kind of VAT and GST increases we see across the board in the name of uh, broadening and expanding taxation measures. And we see also the targeted and temporary cash transfers rather than universal social protection systems, as well as the labor flexibilization. 
Despite powerful advocacy and awareness raising by feminist justice and women's rights activists, the IMF has never formally acknowledged its role in exacerbating gender inequality through its fiscal and monetary policy advice. Let's not forget that central bank uh, policies have a huge role on gender equality as well. So the IMF has a critical opportunity to do so in its first gender strategy, which will, which is in process right now and will be going to the executive board in 2022 early next year. I just also want to emphasize that there is now a fundamental imperative, a, a critical urgency to reformulate these fiscal policy rules, to rethink the fiscal doctrine from the outdated and absolutely egregious human rights violating neoclassical economic models to that of a reorientation to categorize public spending, not as one-off discretionary consumption, but to that of critical investment. So under current fiscal discipline rules, we see the IMF, how they categorize public expenditure, even in social sectors and essential services as consumption, and therefore short-term and one-off. This fails to take account the historical evidence and the intuitive know-how that investment in human beings, investment in women and girls, investment in social services is regenerative. It yields back, it returns back productivity, rights, equity, economic and social development and lays the groundwork for a resilient economy which the IMF's rhetoric is oftentimes promoting. So in conclusion, to also emphasize that the right to development has to be centered in IMF resistance, because we have to see in the international community that our gaze can no longer look the other way when the state protects creditors and investors at the expense of people's economic and social rights. So without an urgency of multilateral action for a debt restructuring mechanism, for a global tax body, for fiscal justice, for the redistribution of the special drawing rights to expand fiscal space for budget support needs, we will not be able to avert such grave consequences as facing a lost decade in the coming 10 years with the pathways to achieving the sustainable development goals as well as the Paris Agreement on climate change being effectively derailed. So the counterfactual is a lost decade for the vast majority of the human race. And so it is incumbent that the principles of historical responsibility and a fundamental reorientation of the age old fiscal doctrine really involves a a serious process of decolonizing the fiscal policy rules that are guiding the financial assistance to developing countries today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bumika. This wonderful um, as a, 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 a great last intervention for us. Um, some really important uh, uh, elements added to 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 um, what others have said as well. Uh, we've now got a few questions which we want to sort of open. Uh, to the panelists to answer. There's one in the chat uh, from Katharina, which I think maybe Haldis will be able to answer. There's three in the Q&A, uh, one from Professor Keith Lewin, two from Maria Rombalsera. Uh, just to kick us off, I'm going to pass us over briefly to Rose Salbrink, my co-author on the report, um, who I think can uh, help to answer Maria's uh, one of Maria's questions. So over to you, Rose, for some uh, initial responses, and then we'll um, perhaps go to Isabel uh, to answer the others and then to Haldis uh, for Katarina's question and anybody who wants to jump in to respond to Keith's question. Thank you very much and thank you to uh, everyone uh, for their great contributions. I think it's very clear uh, that the current situation is not working. I wanted to respond to um, the questions in relation to debt and about the private sector um, and I think Going back to what Caroline Otin told us at the beginning around the conditionalities of the IMF and the World Bank on the structural adjustment programs in the 80s and in 90s, um, this has been ongoing for a very long time, uh, this fiscal consolidation. And um, this has really pushed countries to uh, get loans from the private sector because they are trying to avoid these conditionalities. Um, in addition to that, uh, because of very low interest rates in countries in the global north, especially in the US, 
which uh, is uh, obviously uh, the dollar is used as a currency in which a lot of debt is denominated. Um, this low interest has meant that finance, uh, financial flows have been looking for higher uh, return on investment uh, and therefore uh, pushing uh, speculative finance uh, across countries in the global south. So the benefit of, at the benefit of having low interest uh, rates by central banks in the global north, this has created these speculative uh, financial flows and pushed them in, around the world. Uh, what's important to understand here, I think, is also that the IMF uh, should be considered and is in its role a lender of last resort uh, for governments that are uh, experiencing um, problems in their balance of payment. So uh, in, in that regard, uh, no country would, would probably go to the IMF if it's not uh, highly necessary. So these conditions um, wouldn't, wouldn't stop them from, uh, or, or don't stop countries to coming to the IMF and they really need it. However, in the current situation, countries uh, are left with no choice. Um, and the problem with the IMF that hasn't been touched on is, uh, and has come to the fore with the DBR scandal, sorry, the doing business report scandal, um, is the unequality, uh, unequal governance system that is really perpetuating these neocolonial structures that have already been mentioned by several colleagues. Um, so this means that the system uh, the IMF is holding in place is benefiting countries in the global north. Uh, it is um, using uh, the international financial system to accumulate wealth in the hands of a few, and um, debt is used as the reason, or debt repayment is used as the reason to uh, 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 enact uh, austerity. So it's a very, very direct and important link here. Um, however, the austerity programs, um, many research has found, and also all the experiences that have shown that actually the conditionalities aren't allowing countries to pay back their debt, as it's essentially shrinking uh, the public budget and, and stopping investment into uh, countries. Therefore, uh, many countries have been in uh, perpetual circles of, of debt repayment, austerity, and not being able to pay back, et cetera, coming back to the IMF again and again. And as has already been pointed out, this is really uh, an issue of redistribution. So the current system is facilitating the accumulation of wealth in the hands of a few, and uh, those who can aren't currently paying their fair contribution, both in, in taxes uh, in a national level the illicit financial flows have already been pointed out, but also um, the lack of responding to the current uh, financial crisis and all these private creditors who have not been involved in um, debt restructuring. And this is another point that is very crucial at the moment to create this fiscal space. Um, one other thing that is important to, to understand is that the um, uh, current GDP doesn't take into account unpaid care work. Uh, disproportionately done by women and girls, as already pointed out, um, and as, as explained by Bumika, really paying with their time and bodies and health uh, to repay these debts. So it is really important that we go beyond just ending austerity uh, to also taking a feminist approach and considering how we are counting uh, women's work into the economy, but also uh, assessing all these policies on the impact that they're having on human rights. Um, thank you very much. Back to you, David. Thank you, Rose. I'm going to pass over to Isabel if you have some thoughts uh, on the other uh, questions from uh, Maria or uh, from uh, Keith Lewin. Yes, uh, David, thank you. I mean, again, um, I think what is very important to highlight here is that this report is crucial uh, for to have these national dialogues that we are proposing as the really alternative for austerity cuts uh, done behind closed doors. And then in this national dialogue, um, one of the things that, that civil society citizens will do will be say, we don't want them because they have negative impacts and we have to look for alternatives. And the key will be to put all these alternatives um, on the table and they must be discussed openly by everybody. So the power is actually to put as many alternatives as possible because, um, and thinking of the, and then in the debate, think which ones may be better uh, for the country. Not all countries are able to do them in the same full force. Uh, some countries will be able to do only very little of one and a lot of another one, etc. So the architecture and the strategy will be different. 
And then I have a couple of questions once on that. Each of the eight options I mentioned, they have, of course, a number of SUF options. So actually there are many, particularly tax is a little long, but the same in debt. Uh, so how will you reduce debt? Okay, so there are a number of options here. I don't, I'm just referring to historical, recent historical experiences that have been successful. So in to reduce debt, we can do renegotiate debt that's renegotiated with creditors. And we have more than 60 successful countries recently. You can achieve debt forgiveness or debt relief, as we have seen in the HIPIC initiative, though it has to be that only a very few number of countries achieve that and a high cost. You can do debt swaps or debt, debt, debt swaps or conversions. And we have more than 50 countries have done that in recent years. You can repudiate debt. And we have very successful examples, for instance, in Iceland or Iraq that was done with the full support of the United States and you can default and we have more than 20 countries that have done it successfully in recent years including Argentina and Russia or Ecuador and by the way they always said that this is the worst of the options but you see you look at places like Argentina well it was bad the first two years and then later it picked up and had higher growth than many other countries so the key thing is to you know the, the mythify, um, you know, the, the, it's a treat, treat these topics as real options that country have, and and have them and have a serious decision um, in national dialogue. Then there's also a question on on inflation. Um, there's a lot of work done, including work by by ActionAid earlier. You might want to look at the important work of Rick Rowden um, also after. Um, in, in recent years. And virtually what happens is that as you, as the question is saying, what can we do to go beyond the 5%? Yes, we understand that countries should, they are advised to go below 5% level of inflation and they should never go to higher inflation that let's say is more than 25%. But between 5% and 25%, between these two trenches, there's actually a large gray zone that actually it's not so bad. It's just a gray middle zone, okay? And if uh, if you look at many papers, including papers by the IMF, they question what may be the right austerity, uh, sorry, inflation levels. And many point inflation levels to 12%, 15%, 7%, 8%. I mean, there are, you can download uh, different papers that they were mentioned and you will, you will find uh, the information there, the list of papers and the different, uh, uh, inflation uh, levels supported. Um, so again, you know, policies are policies, there are decisions taken, um, there are decisions and options, and they should be studied, including the social impacts that they have. And then, but not done behind closed doors, uh, uh, you know, when they affect the life of millions and millions of people. The key message is we must go to national open dialogue. Thank you. Thank you so much, Isabel. And I think that issue about the secrecy, the behind closed doors nature of so much of the dialogue between the IMF and, uh, and ministries of finance really have to break that and demand greater transparency and democracy in these processes. I am going to pass over to how this is a question from Katarina uh, Popovic uh, from the International Council of Adult Education talking about um, uh, how, how you trade or balance the uh, input with uh, of ICT and uh, teachers so that technology doesn't replace <laughs> teachers, but enhances their role. Can you say a few words about that, Harold? Well, I could try to say a few words, but say, you know, it's difficult to solve such a complex question, but I think basically that Katerina in the chat has, has phrased the challenge very precisely. Because in the education sector, of course, we cannot uh, dismiss the use of technology and not see that also as a great opportunity to support education. Uh, but And we've learned that through the pandemic too. But what I think we've also learned through the pandemic is that new technologies, and that including AI, actually cannot replace real life people and personal contact. So it's uh, it's about how striking the balance of how to use it pedagogically correct, but not replacing. Uh, we are working very closely on this and monitoring, but I would say sort of as a baseline, yes, we need connectivity and we need the equipment in education, 
But as I've said used to in the past, also when it comes to politicians, that they should stop at the school gate and let the teachers control it within the school gate. Because where the real danger lies is the content of the apps or the devices or the programs. That's where the danger of data collection around your students lies, data collection around teachers lies, and also the danger of developing teaching and learning programs that are not bottom up and tailored to the students you are to teach, but that are tailored more generic and have a purpose of making money of them. So I would say that teachers need to have the professional control of content. I also believe that public authorities should have a quality control of it, of what they let into their schools. And uh, teachers should have the choice and professional freedom of what they use and when they use for the best uh, for their students. But there is an additional financial challenge here. We've talked about it here. Technology is very often seen as an investment and is then put on the investment budget and not seen as teachers' wages, as consumption, as was mentioned earlier here. So we must be, be very careful that it's not seen as um, a cheaper way of investing in education because they can put it off as a long-term investment and it can depreci depreciate it so that it uh, comes across as cheaper because it's not cheaper. I think we know technology is not cheap in the long run, that uh, it is um, good support, but cannot replace. I know I could go on for, for a very long time, but this yeah. is, is happening. The OECD is looking at it. UNESCO is looking at it. And it's, it needs close monitoring, just like budgets do. So we have about five minutes left of this international segment of the launch before we um, pause and then pass over to West Africa. Uh, we have, um, I think, some of uh, the uh, broad question raised by uh, uh, Professor Keith Lewin um, uh, around what can we do to create fiscal states not dependent on the IMF and World Bank. I think Isabel has helped to answer part of that. If anyone else wants to come in on that, please do so. Um, I think we've then got uh, Aminata from Sierra Leone saying, how can citizens break the rules of the cult? Uh, and Jamil in the Q&A saying, uh, taking uh, the alternatives into consideration, are we advocating for more internal measures to fund public services? Are we moving away from aid and loan dependency? I think a short answer to that last bit is definitely yes, we're trying to get break that aid and loan dependency because it's when you're subject to, you know, when you're dependent on loans that you become more uh, under the powers and the, uh, the will of the IMF um, and strengthening your domestic tax base in a progressive way uh, has to be a, a, a way of moving towards greater autonomy and sustainability. And I think how we uh, break the rules of the cult, it's, it's about the strength and depth of the movements that we can bring together across different constituencies. Um, you know, it's in every country, you know, despite uh, uh, the powers of the IMF at a global level, in the end, it's a battle in each and every country of bringing together the different, uh, the, 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 the trade union movements, the NGOs who are serious about uh, uh, progressive change, uh, the, the, the public campaigns for, for public health and education, the tax and fiscal justice, the feminists, the youth movements. It's about bringing together as broad a coalition as possible to end this cult of austerity and put pressure on your own national government to resist. Um, and I think I can see Rosa wanting to come in. So I'm gonna pass over to Rosa briefly. Um, uh, and just briefly to say uh, that uh, yes, uh, uh, we need uh, to strengthen our, and to be bolder in the attempt uh, to uh, uh, break uh, the rules of this uh, cult. Um, I think, for instance, uh, that uh, the campaign that we are developing for redesigning, uh, redefining the social care work um, uh, including uh, um, the fact uh, that uh, care work uh, is not just uh, a female area of the labor market, but needs to be a social engagement of governments, of the community to change uh, this idea that care is just, you know, uh, dedicated to family. Uh, 
uh, is something very important. And is something that can change also the uh, economic perspective. This is why I hate, I hate the definition of care economy. Care is a social issue and has to be called social care. It has been mentioned the importance of, uh, uh, you know, um, introducing uh, rules for uh, um, multinational corporates uh, to pay their fair share, to pay tax, uh, progressive taxation. Let me add, please invite people not to vote politicians that promises to reduce tax. <laughs> the tax has to be increased on capital, on uh, corporates, on wealth. And uh, uh, finally, just uh, to add uh, a point to what Haldis said about uh, uh, digitalization and uh, the role that uh, artificial intelligence and digitalization will have in future, particularly impacting on public services. I'm thinking, for instance, uh, uh, not only to the broad uh, um, public administration, but in the health sector is already there. Uh, I think that one of the campaigns that we need to put in place and to strengthen is the campaign for data as public good. And this is the only way for us uh, to have control of the use of data and uh, to reduce the interference uh, of corporates as well as the interference of non-democratic governments. Thank you, Rosa. I'm going to pass briefly to Bumika, who's going to uh, uh, chip in on uh, Keith's uh, question, but we will have to wrap up very uh, quickly. So, Bumika. Uh, just, a, just a quick uh, pitching in on Professor Keith Lewin's very important question and um, this, this, this really serious consideration of how uh, to address the structural dependency and how fiscal independence. Um, and just wanted to really highlight that one of the key drivers across most global South countries where, you know, Professor Lewin mentioned that even when there's low uh, debt levels or even when, um, you know, um, there, there isn't heavy debt, they're willing to respond to IMF conditionalities and take our IMF loans well. Um, you know, in this broad scenario, there is a question of the structural dependency that most developing countries have on accessing external finance and particularly access and inclusion into international capital markets and the incredible role that the IMF plays in providing a signal, particularly to credit rating agencies and international lenders, banking conglomerates and the Wall Street. Um, complex, the Wall Street City of London complex, the financial markets and banks and investment firms um, in, in total. And this conversation on the absolutely fundamental intersection of financialization, footloose finance capital, you know, portfolio financing flows um, and, and, you know, the world of hot money and speculative financial flows and the reality of this cult of austerity, you know, needs to be front and center. In the modern economic era, you know, with the exception of a few countries, you know, like Argentina, there hasn't been any particular debt default. Most developing countries do not default on their debt. And in fact, the IMF notes that most most countries taking out loans or receiving assistance pay back their debts early, in fact, and as we know, with surcharge fees. Um, so there really isn't a scenario of debt default. And we need to ask why. Why no debt default, even when the consequences of prioritizing the debt are so glaringly visceral in the violation of people's economic and social rights and the risks of poverty. And this comes back to this structural dependency on the access to external finance, access to international capital markets, the need to stay good in the eyes of an international investors and lenders. And we need to trace this to the systematic erosion 
of economic diversification and the prospects of developing countries to raise their own domestic revenue. We know domestic revenue has fallen over the last many decades, particularly across Africa and the deindustrialization, the, the, the natural resource extraction, um, tax evasion are all at the center of this, including unfair trade rules that thwart productive capacities and really impair the nexus of production and investment where productivity and investment are synergistic and, and interplay with each other. If we can't raise uh, productivity through economic diversification, through, through, through higher value added, through different kinds of labor skills, then the investment flows are also impaired. And thus there is a dependency on seeking the investment and the capital from external sources, rather than having the self-sufficiency and national self-determination as well as policy space um, nationally. So, just uh, uh, wanted to chip in a little bit of the larger political economy context. And of course, as Isabel and others have mentioned, there are alternatives and there are countries that are doing differently and we need to pay attention to those countries and support them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bumika. And I think we will have to wrap up this segment here. So I'd like to say a very big uh, thank you to Rosa from PSI, Haldis from EI, Bumika from Third World Network, Isabel Ortiz from uh, Institute of Policy Dialogue, Initiative for Policy Dialogue, sorry, and, uh, and uh, who else am I missing? Caroline Otim from the Global Life of Tax Justice, who, who had to uh, leave us. Wonderful in contributions. Thank you very much. I hope everyone gets a chance to read uh, the uh, report, uh, which is uh, available now, and there are versions of it in French, Spanish, Portuguese, Arabic, Nepalese, and hopefully uh, other languages shortly. Um, so uh, those can be found on uh, our websites. Um, thank you very much again. I'm going to close this segment. Now, stay on. Anybody who wants to now move on to our final segment of the day, which is hosted by colleagues in West Africa, where we will hear stories from uh, Ghana, Nigeria, Senegal and Sierra Leone, as well as people working at a regional level. Um, and we'll be passing over to uh, Zakaria, who has just uh, uh, switched his video on. Hi there, uh, Zakaria, uh, who will lead us uh, in the next segment. So we'll have a pause now um, as uh, panelists for the next segment set themselves up, um, and we'll be starting that next segment in nine minutes from now. Uh, just leaves me to say thank you again to everyone uh, for a, a wonderful uh, segment of uh, for the international launch and we look forward to continuing to work with all of you um, but for many years to come because uh, it's, it, this is a long-term struggle this is not going to change overnight but i think if we can build it in each and every country and international cooperation we can together end this cult of austerity so thank you very much thank you very much goodbye So now we pass to our technical support just to test the panelists for the next section. Thank you, Mr. David. Uh, we're now going to stop the live streaming. Uh, yes, your sound quality is perfect and uh, the visual. Bonjour. Also. Okay, bonjour, Mr. Nathalie. Good afternoon. Uh, no, it's not Mr. Nathalie, it's. Uh... Okay. It's, uh, uh, it's one of the speaker who okay. joined us, but we uh, he joined us on the, that Natalie's uh, uh, address. Maybe, maybe, maybe to be okay. a better idea to rename the account. Okay. Okay. Bonjour, bonjour à tout le monde. Oui, camarade, tu peux tu peux te renommer s'il te plaît. Moi-même. Oui. <laughs> tu cliques sur le bouton en haut à droite pour mettre ton nom. Nathalie, comment yes. va Ça va très bien, merci. En haut à droite, je cherche. Okay, voilà. so welcome to all the speakers. I'm seeing that they are starting to join the conversation. So we are seeing Nigeria uh, conversation. So we are seeing Nigeria, uh, Ghana, Senegal. 
I'm not seeing Sada Leon. I don't know if they are already online. We are online. So, okay. Yes, thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Zach, Hi, yeah. Fude. Can thank we you. Have, uh, uh, Hi, Zach. Can we have this time? <laughs> good, 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 good. Yeah. Okay, great. So. Okay, we'll start in, let's say, five minutes. I think we are... I think Nigeria colleagues, can you hear us? Yes, good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. How are you guys doing? We are fine. Good. The Nigerian so, team is uh, set. We've been waiting. Yeah, so we we'll start. Our so we we'll start in, in, uh, in three, three, five minutes, yeah. Okay. Okay, Mr. Zakaria, just to confirm something, Mr. Zakaria. Yes, yes, I can hear you. On the run sheet, we have two videos that are supposed to be played throughout this session. Okay. Okay, so the first one is the video from PSI Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And the second one is the PSI from Ghana. Okay. So these okay. two videos have been queued. We okay. will just be waiting for you to request the technical to play them. Okay, that's fine. That's okay, fine. According to the order, so we'll I, I will let the, you know. So you are the one who is uh, uh, yes, playing we'll the video running okay. on the back end. Yes, yeah. for those two okay. videos. I don't know if there's any other media that need to be played because we have received. No, no, no. I think we have only the two and the two videos that need to be played. Okay, perfect. Also, so, this video is uh, yeah. having live interpretation. So for okay. French speaking, they can go to the interpretation button at mm -hmm. the bottom the application and they can choose to listen to the French version of the discussion. Okay, that's okay. fine. So, um, we okay, stand by. Yeah, it's okay. I think, uh, I don't know if David is here, so. Okay. And, uh, hi, yes, Natalie. Yes, maybe uh, at the beginning you can take a um, few